I would really like to thank uh, our presenters and welcome them today. Uh, so uh, we have Claire uh, Utman, Sun Jones, um, who are both uh, chartered psychologists working at Queen Margaret uh, University uh, in Edinburgh, and Soraya Kana, uh, who is an educational psychologist working in South England. And of course, if you want, you can tell us more about uh, your work. And I think I'll stop talking now and I'll let you continue and then uh, share this exciting project with us, please. And uh, please feel free to add your uh, comments or questions uh, using you know, the chat box. Thanks. Hello everyone and as Stella said thank you so much for coming this evening. Um, we've got a project that we really love that we're going to present to you um, so we're really excited to do so and to hear your thoughts on it. So we are looking at disability representation and disability literacy and the ways that we can foster inclusion through something called the toy box tales. I can have the next slide. So we've done the welcome and introduction bit we're going to present some theory and some research evidence that, that um, supports the uh, use of the resources. Then we'll talk you through the resources themselves. Um, between doing that, um, we've got a we jam board discussion. And as Stella said, um, you're free to put uh, responses in the chat, to put your hand up or to use the jam board as you feel most comfortable. And at the end, we'll have another discussion um, with some question and answers as well. And as ever, with the best of these things, we would love some evaluation data from you. Um, I'm not ever precious about slides. Um, so here is a copy of the slides. If you would like a copy of the slides or you can use the QR code um, on the screen to get yourself a copy of the slides. That's never a problem. Next slide. So. I guess identity is a really big in, in part of this. Um, so I am vulnerable in this presentation um, and I share some of my own experiences as, as a disabled student and as a disabled um, researcher. Um, so if you share part of yourselves and you feel happy and confident to do that and to be vulnerable, then we welcome that and we will be being vulnerable as well. Um, we encourage the sharing of lived experience around these things um, and we really want to foster a space where we can respect one another and where take the learning away from the room but maybe don't take people's names away from the room um, so I think that's called Chatham House Rules on this we really like that as a value before we go any further um, so next slide please um, so, yeah, we'll talk about representation of disability in children's material culture. So by that, we mean their books, their films, um, playground equipment, um, lots of different things that children interact with in their day to day lives. We look very specifically at the possibility for play to affect children's responses to disabled people. And what we'd like is for disability representation to become mainstream because the evidence base is showing us how important that representation is and how effective integrating imagination with play is in terms of addressing disability as a systemic inequality. So a lot of the time when we're talking about inclusive education, in these spaces, we're talking about making accommodations and adaptations to environments to support learners who are disabled in some way. What we're looking at is the way in which disability is systemically not recognised um, as, as an identity in those spaces and how it could be better represented in in classrooms, in schools, and indeed in university settings, although tonight we're focusing very much on the primary classroom. Next slide, please. So one of the underpinning theories that we use is the theory of contact. It's a very old theory, um, a first genesis by Allport in 1954. Um, more recent work um, has shown that when it comes to direct contact, um, knowing someone who is disabled is what matters. 
So 17% of people who don't know anyone, who don't think they know anyone who is disabled, think that there's a lot of prejudice towards disabled people. But compare that with 37% who have a disabled friend who think that there is a lot of prejudice. So knowing someone who has that identity is what's critical there. 2% of people who work with a disabled person think that they would get in the way. 10% um, of those who don't know anyone with a disability think that they would get in the way. So again, it seems to be knowing someone and having that contact that really matters in terms of attitudes towards disabled people. Next slide, please. Imagined contact is a relatively recent idea. So we're going from 1954 to 2009. Um, and this is from the work of Richard Crisp and Rhiannon Turner. And simply put, rather than putting people in situations where they're making direct contact with one another, what we're doing is asking children or adults to imagine themselves having contact with someone who is in some way different from themselves. Imagine contact is simple, and we know that children, when we work with children, they have very strong imagine, imaginations. There's a vast amount of literature um, around the power of imagined contact in adults and a burgeoning literature when it comes to the power of imagined contact in children. We know it can access feelings and thoughts and behavioural scripts as well, so it can really have that influence on responses. And when we started this research, that's the point that we started from thinking about how imagined contact and imagination might play into responses. Um, there's been some previous stuff on this, so I'll go through that. Lindsay Cameron um, had some 2D pictures of children who uh, were disabled in some way. Um, the children were between five and nine years old and using fuzzy felt, because that is the best way to do these things, of course. Um, she invited the children to put those photographs onto the fuzzy felt and to imagine interacting with what she called a typically developing child or a child with a physical disability or an intellectual disability. And then she measured um, outgroup attitudes towards uh, people with a disability. Now, social identity theory isn't one that I have a great relationship with at the moment, and I specifically don't like that term outgroup attitude, but that's another story for another day. Um, but what she found was that non-disabled children had a more positive attitude towards disabled children after doing that than did children who didn't interact with that fuzzy felt in that way. She also found that intended friendships increase, but only in a younger age group. So that brings me to the question of how we are framing disability if we're not thinking about typical versus atypical development as we tend to do in psychology. Um, but I wish we wouldn't do any more. Um, so we'll start with the medical model. Um, the medical model suggests that disability is the impairment. Impairment is the disability. So what is wrong with the body is what is disabling. Um, and you get a diagnosis and that diagnosis tells you what disability you have. And from that, the supports come into place if we're thinking in educational settings. From the 1970s onwards, um, Mike Oliver and colleagues uh, started writing about something called the social model of disability. And that said, actually, yes, there's impairment for sure, but impairment isn't what's important here. What's important um, and what is disabling is the attitudes that you come across um, and the environments that you come across. And if the environments aren't accessible, that is what is disabling. If attitudes aren't accepting, that is what is disabling. So if uh, there's a student on the campus, for example, and I have a lecture on the third floor, as I often do, and the lift is broken and she can't access the third floor, then it's the lift that is disabling her, not um, her mobility impairment. Um, there's also affirmative models of disability which run alongside social models and take that a step further and say let's celebrate disabled people's identities and let's reclaim a lot of the terms that have been used in an unhelpful fashion in the past 
And let's think about how we can create positive identities around being disabled. Where we're sticking at the moment is somewhere between the social model and the affirmative model in terms of thinking about the ways that we can speak about disability with children. We're thinking about accessible environments, um, swings that you can go on in a wheelchair. Um, we're thinking about mixed mops. If you haven't discovered mixed mops yet, go and look at Channel 5 Milkshake. It's brilliant. Um, very good positive and social model disability representation. And we're thinking about um, other ways in which children's environments are accessible and they are positively represented in their resources. So that's kind of where we are in terms of framing a disability. Representation of disability has been there for quite some time. So when I was at school, I read what Katie did. I read Peter Pan, I read Secret Garden, I read Heidi, I learned about Clara, I learned about Colin, I learned about Hook um, and Katie. Um, so in Katie, in the Secret and in the Secret Garden and in um, Heidi, those characters, Colin, Clara um, and uh, Katie, they're disabled for sure, they get better. And there's that tragedy narrative that goes with disability. And it's from an earlier model almost than the medical model, which says that disability is something less than. Um, and it's something that we need to overcome. And it's something that um, the, the miracle is in getting better. And you're not really a whole person until you've gotten better. Katie has been rewritten by Jacqueline Wilson. And there's other books now that foster much more positive attitudes because they celebrate people who are disabled and positively represent them. And by that, we're thinking about um, the main character in James Catchpole's What Happened to You. We're thinking about the bear in Can Bear Ski. We're thinking about Edie Eckhart in um, Rosie Jones's um, The Amazing Edie Eckhart, who has cerebral palsy, for example. And we know um, as educators that that kind of representation that, um, that busts some stereotypes actually fosters socio-emotional skills and belonging along the way. Next slide, please. So most of our work has been done in schools and it's been done with toys. And toys is an interesting one because in 2016, I did some work with Lego um, as part of a BBC See Here documentary, and they said that any minifigure in their assortment could be deaf if a child decided to pretend play that it was. They also said that they'd introduced a Lego element that represented a wheelchair, but they hadn't launched a disabled minifigure. I can't square that. I still can't square that. I can't work out what they mean by that. They've got a wheelchair, but they don't represent disability. Who knows? Um, nevertheless, in 2020 and 2022, they changed the voice to say, we're committed to developing Lego sets in a way that ensures that they are representative of the world in which children are living. We're going to continue to include minifigures that portray people with diverse ages, professions, genders, and characteristics. And what we've seen is up to 2016, virtually zero representation of disability and toys outside of a hospital set through to uh, a, a greater um, representation of disability in the toys from hearing aids, from school ramps and elevators and buses that take disability out of the hospital and say, disabled people, here they are going about their everyday lives. Next slide, please. So that's what's happening with toys. At school, representation remains quite low. So Vavaza and colleagues um, did something called um, the Inventory of Disability Representation. It's a very involved and very lengthy survey of a school environment. It looks at everything. It looks at the walls. It looks at the um, classroom materials. It looks at drama. It looks at toys. The lot. Um, in 32 infant classrooms, Favaza found that there were 22 that had very low representation of disabled children. Um, eight classrooms had no representations of disabled people um, and two classrooms had some representation of disabled people. 
Um, we know about things like the circle framework, um, which will focus on participation through um, accessing um, activities rather than focusing on diversity of representation. And that's where we're laying our focus. Um, final note on toys um, to consolidate the difference between the medical and the social model. So Smile at Becky was produced in 1996 um, and there was a big issue with um, Smile at Becky. Her wheelchair was far too big for the Barbie dream house she can get in. And the Barbie dream house is the epitome of life if you were six years old. Um, Mattel could have done two things about that. They could have changed Becky, made her wheelchair a little bit more slimline so it would go in the house medical model thinking, they could have changed the house to make it more accessible. They still haven't changed the house to make it accessible. And in 1997, they scrapped Smiler Becky. So that that represents the erstwhile attitude towards disability that we used to see. Um, so the work that we're doing um, aligns much more with um, disability equality duty guidelines that are about um, challenging disabling attitudes and promoting positive attitudes towards disabled people. And around the world, education forms vision for education in 2030 that says that we need to address all forms of exclusion and marginalization and think about equalities in access, in participation and learning outcomes. And around that participation, we're thinking about how we promote belonging to promote participation in learning environments. Cool. Um, because I am where I am, I'm also going to point you to the National Framework for Inclusion and suggest that the resources that we're about to present actually fit quite nicely with that reflective toolkit um, in terms of ways in which you could reflect upon the belonging and structural inequalities in, in classrooms as student teachers, as teachers or as senior teachers. Um, so what are the policies and what are the structures that inhibit inequalities? Well, one of those could be around representation. What impacts on a sense of belonging? Well, if you're not able to see yourself in any of the learning resources, that probably has an impact. In fact, we know it does have an impact on sense of belonging in the learning communities. Um, and one of the ways in which we can promote equality and diversity is through these kind of school based interventions that can foster more positive responses and literacy around disability. OK, so I'm going to take a big breath there. Um, I'm going to come to the first Jamboard discussion. As I say, the question is there and it just asks how your existing practices cover the social and affirmative models of disability, either with your students, if you're a student teacher or with your learners, if you're in a school environment. Um, do do you use this thinking in in your um, in your settings? OK, I've just gone on to uh, Soraya's. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much again for coming. I'm really excited to present my doctoral research um, as I'm now a newly qualified educational psychologist um, just started in September. Um, so um, I wanted to um, take the wonderful information that Sean has just shared and apply it to autistic children. Um, and just note there that I am using um, identity first language um, with autistic children. And the reason for that is based on um, some research that has done recently saying that is the preference um, of um, the majority of those in the autistic community um, and autistic advocates. Um, but I am aware that that's not um, the preference of all. Um, so I'm using these terms as the preference of most. Um, but of course, obviously, when we're working with autistic young people, I do check um, with them or their advocates about what they prefer. Um, just wanted to highlight that. Um, so just to explain the um, the bridging the gap. Um, I guess I want to start with the why here, um, just before we go into the application of Imagine Contact um, in improving responses towards autistic children. Um, I've been very kindly shared um, these slides from my colleague, um, Dr. Elizabeth Atkinson. Um, she's also a newly qualified educational psychologist. And as part of her thesis research, um, she 
looked at doing um she did a systematic literature review um exploring the question of what are the experiences of autistic pupils during their time at primary school because a recent survey um by the national autistic society in 2021 found that just um just a quarter of autistic students feel happy at school um but we have found that a lot of the research primarily focuses on the people who support students um, or pupils in secondary schools, which is really important, but there seem to be um, research lacking about those experiences of autistic pupils in primary. Um, so I'm just going to skim over what she found and then go on to my research. Next slide, please. Um, so through her thematic analysis um, in her systematic literature review, this is one of the themes that came out um, of the papers that she included. Um, so the first one was understand and listen to me. I don't want to look weird. So, um, you know, these are quotes from real, you know, autistic young people in primary school, um, including things like they had a wish that um, staff understood that their behaviour isn't intentional. Um, and they feel that, you know, some of them feel that I am seen, um, but I'm not me. So alluding to that concept of masking or camouflaging their true self. Um, and you know more about what you like than most people. Um, so they you know, some autistic young people can really tunnel and focus into their interests. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the next theme is around the importance of social connection um, and how, you know, they want to be treated like a human being, like we all do. Um, and um, one autistic young person said about how, you know, sometimes they are on their own and by themselves, but they like that. Um, and I think that's important to hold in mind. Sometimes we put our own um, assumptions about friendship and social relationships onto others. Um, so, you know, naturally, uh, because we care, uh, but just something that's really important to be mindful of. Um, and some other quotes, um, this was quite difficult to read about, you know, being treated like a freak alien monster and as if they had germs um, that you know that gets to me every time I read that but I think really important to highlight um next slide please um and another theme here about success matters but environment is key um thinking along about Sharm, about what was Sharma saying with that social model you know what can we change what barriers can we change in the environment um so this is a really interesting one. When I was a teacher, I would come uh, into the classroom and ask children in my class, what did you do this summer? And I like this quote because it says that this young person was terrified when they were asked, what did you do this summer? The summer is such a big thing. So they didn't know what to say and that, you know, what are the expectations? How do I respond? What does that question mean? Um, so, yeah, I really like that quote uh, and it's yeah definitely impacted on me. Um, next slide, please. So the implications of um, Lizzie's research um, from a quote, which is really exemplified in this quote, is, you know, everyone needs to learn more. Um, and, you know, thinking about that social connection in particular, how do we increase that sense of belonging, acceptance and understanding for autistic young people? Well, I think, um, well, we think that one of the answers could be through imagined contact. Next, please. Um, so I looked um, at two, re I, I had two research questions for my study. Uh, the first one was, um, does participating in an imagined contact intervention with 3D toy figures improve children's responses towards their autistic peers? Um, and I um, hypothesised that they would, so taking part in this imagined contact intervention would increase children's attitudes intentions um, and their self-reported behaviour, which I'll explain how we um, assessed uh, later on um, and would increase. Um, and then I also looked at, um, OK, if we do find that these uh, variables increase, why? Why are they increasing? So I looked at which variables mediate the relationship between taking part in this imagined contact intervention and their responses towards autistic peers. Um, and here I um, looked at four uh, main mediating variables. Um, so I hypothesized an increase in cognitive empathy, um, which is the ability to kind of take on, um, kind of have that deep and understanding of what others might be thinking and feeling, how they interact and experience the world around them. Um, 
Effective empathy, uh, so that's more to do with, you know, understanding the feelings and emotions um, of others. Um, inclusion of the other in the self, uh, that's a bit of a mouthful, uh, but that's essentially the perception of one's degree of closeness um, to another person. Um, so I hypothesise an increase in those three, um, and then I um, hypothesise a decrease in anxiety. Uh, so what did I do? Um, I fortunately had 61 wonderful children um, aged between six to nine. Um, they were in primary schools in Berkshire, which is where I work, um, and they were randomly assigned to either take part in the experimental group. So that was imagining contact with an autistic peer or a control group. So that was imagining contact with um, a neurotypical peer. Um, and just to say that four children identified as autistic across the whole of the sample, and four of them um, stated that they knew at least one autistic person. Um, so as part of the procedure, every child was given an age appropriate definition of autism, which I took from the National Autistic Society. And then the, they were then presented with this treehouse play scene and asked to choose one of four 3D figures with whom they most identified with. So in the middle, there's an example. And then they were presented with either an autistic or neurotypical match doll, um, depending on their assigned group. So here is the autistic doll Hayden, which is a Lottie doll, um, in case you're interested. Um, and then I administered the pre-intervention dependent measures. Um, I'll show you the measures on the next slide. Um, but just to say that for the intervention itself, um, I asked the children to imagine that they went to the park together with this tree house. Um, and I asked them to show me how they were to have a really good time together um, and they had three minutes to do that which is a common length of time that's used in the research and then I administered the post intervention measures. Um, so for the measures I assessed three components of attitudes using the children's attitudes towards autism questionnaire which is quite a newly developed um, scale and that included um, cognitive, affective and behavioural attitudes which are essentially beliefs, feelings and intentions. So I administered this before and after the intervention and they were all measured on a five point Likert scale. Um, and next, um, I looked at self-reported behaviour. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this, uh, so basically we didn't actually observe real behaviour and real interactions between these children and autistic peers. So this is how they reported about their own behaviour. Um, so what I asked them to do firstly is to allocate five coins between a hypothetical, neurotypical and autistic peer. Um, and we looked at the difference between those, uh, between the conditions. And then after that, I asked um, whether children would choose to wear a sticker that said, I care for and support autistic children. Um, and then finally, um, I also administered the measures for those four mediating variables. Um, they were all on a five point Likert scale as well and consisted of a range of two to four questions uh, with examples on the slide. Um, but the exception is inclusion of the other in the self. Um, children represented with four pairs of overlapping circles. I know it's a bit small on the screen. Um, and I asked them to share their degree of closeness. Uh, Right, on to the exciting bit, the results. Um, so I haven't included the numbers on this slide because I just wanted to make it clearer. Um, but if you have any more specific questions, then I'm happy to answer. Um, so firstly, um, I did two way analysis of covariance tests um, to look at the group differences between the experimental and control group in those three attitude components. And I controlled for four covariates. So they were age, sex, whether participants identified as autistic um, and the number of autistic individuals they knew. Um, so. I just wanted to say as well that um, I have combined the three attitude components into one visual format because the pattern of results were the same for all of them. Um, and what we found is, um, so for beliefs, feelings and behavioural intentions, the post-intervention scores, which are the red bars, um, were significantly more positive in the experimental group compared to the control group. Um, 
and there were no significant differences at pre-intervention. So that indicated to us that those attitudes were at similar levels before the intervention took place. And we also found a significant improvement in the mean scores from uh, before to after the intervention. So we're going from blue to red now um, that in the experimental group, um, but we didn't find any significant increase um, in the control group. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so to look at this self-reported behaviour, um, I did a binomial logistic regression and I was looking at whether there was a difference in groups for that uh, for the post intervention sticker measure. Um, so we controlled for the covariates that I mentioned before, as well as the pre intervention coin uh, measure that I showed you. Um, the model unfortunately wasn't significant. As you can see, the choice to wear a sticker or not was very similar between the, um, the groups. And reflecting back, we wondered whether, um, you know, wearing a sticker accurately represents attitudes and behaviours um, towards autistic peers. Um, some of the children were quite young and I think they wanted to choose a sticker because they saw other classmates have, uh, have them. So, you know, future research should um, definitely observe children's authentic interactions um, in multiple contexts. I think that would be a lot better. Um, OK, now we're on to the mediation. Um, so again, I have oversimplified the diagram without the numbers for the purpose of this presentation, but happy to share more detail if anyone wants it. Um, so this was an exciting found, finding. Um, we found um, a serial process, which is almost like a chain reaction. So um, for those who imagined contact with an autistic peer, um, their positive beliefs about autistic children emerged first. So that suggests to us that that understanding and knowledge played a crucial role in potentially shaping the participants initial attitudes, um, because then these posit positive beliefs in turn led to more positive feelings towards autistic children, um, which is quite expected because people do tend to feel more positively about something when they understand and appreciate um, their experiences more. Um, and then finally, um, these positive feelings influence then positive intentions towards autistic children and created that meaningful chain of change. Um, and just to say that when we reverse the order, so feelings and then beliefs, um, there was no significant um, effect. So that emphasizes that potential important role of knowledge and understanding first, um, represented by positive beliefs in shaping attitudes um, and then in behavioral intentions. Um, next, I looked at those four main mediators separately, um, but I've just combined two of them here for ease, so cognitive empathy and inclusion of the other in the self. So firstly, I found that imagining contact with an autistic peer um, increases positive intentions towards autistic children through um, increasing cognitive empathy. So adopting the perspective of autistic children um, and an increase in inclusion of the other in the self. So feeling more psychologically connected to them. Next slide, please. Uh, in a surprising twist, um, I found that instead of reducing anxiety, as we had initially predicted, the intervention alone um, led to an increase in anxiety amongst the participants. Um, and when I examined that link in isolation, um, it, it seemed that imagining contact with an autistic peer was associated with negative intentions. Um, can you just click to the next? I'll just show the rest of the model now. Thank you. Um, but when we took the whole model um, into account, so all of the effects, we still found that imagining contact with an autistic peer was still leading to those positive intentions with autistic children. And I thought, mm, what's going on here? So when you actually add in the cognitive empathy and the inclusion of the self, um, we actually found that they almost acted as a buffer against that anxiety. So we kind of tentatively hypothesised that having a better understanding of autistic people's experiences and feeling psychologically connected to them through imagining play um, might have acted um, and kind of decreased that anxiety slightly. Um, so I guess think of it as a situation where you might feel a bit nervous about interacting with someone new, um, but as you get to know their 
perspective and feel connected to them um you still want to you know you want to be more friendly and helpful um towards them so i get that this has raised more questions than we originally had so we definitely need future research um but it's very interesting finding and just to say that um there was no significant effect for effective empathy and we did run the analysis without those participants who identified as or knew someone who's autistic and the pattern of results were the same Okay, uh, this will be the last slide of me talking. Um, so uh, here are some implications um, from this research and I've split this into different levels. So at um, a kind of wider systemic level, um, we felt that a broad implication of these findings is that imagined contact might be a way um, through which we might address what's called the double empathy problem. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have heard of that, but essentially it um, suggests that autistic and neurotypical people struggle to understand each other sometimes because not that an autistic ch child or young person is uh, deficient in any way, it's actually that there's a mismatch in their um, social expectations and experiences of how neurotypical and autistic um, young people experience the world around them. Um, but what this intervention offers is an opportunity to gain insight into those experiences and challenges faced by an autistic child child in a really relatable, safe and cooperative way, um, which then might potentially facilitate that deeper understanding of how autistic children experience the world. Um, and this has been highlighted as really important from Lizzie's research that I mentioned earlier. Um, at a targeted intervention level, um, you know, we feel that a big strength of this study is that it has contributed to the early development of evidence based components of an imagined contact intervention. Um, so that includes, you know, that optimal duration for imagined contact of three minutes, um, a tangible method that doesn't rely on language or written skills, so playing with the 3D figures, um, and also providing information about disability, highlighting similarities, strengths, um, and challenges. Um, and then finally, um, Oh, I'm just part of that targeted intervention um, because the research in imagined contact is still in its infancy. Um, I suggested that perhaps, you know, you might want to combine it with something like the circle of friends, which is an example of a direct contact intervention, um, which I'm happy to talk about in more detail, just don't have time right now. Um, and then finally, um, at a more universal level, um, we feel that the application of imagined contact could be integrated into school settings through, um, I say, strategically placing toy figures representing autism, because it's, you know, it's not just enough to put these figures um, amongst other play items. Um, you know, we really recommend that practitioners provide guidance and explanation when introducing these toys, um, you know, including really sensitive, specific information about autism, helping to create play scenarios where children can imagine working together um, on shared goals, um, and really stressing the importance of imagining a positive interaction, um, as research has shown that imagining negative contact can actually increase prejudice, as you might expect. Um, and we've also um, advise that educators themselves uh, receive guidance about you know how to do this and I hope that leads nicely on to what Claire is going to show you now. Thank you so much. Okay thanks Soraya. Um, I'm just gonna take charge for myself now instead of for everybody else. Um, I'm just gonna take you through um, what Shan and I have been working on at QMU, which is the development of what we're calling the Scottish Chatty Pack and the series of educational resources, which I think really brings together the information that Shan and Soraya have presented about the importance of representation and imagined contact and how we can really embed that in the classroom. Um, so the, 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 the resources that we're going to present here are, are available for, for people to use now, and I'm going to make sure you get um, access to those at the end of the presentation. Um, just to give you a bit of background um, in terms of this project, um, where it's come from and how long we've been working on this, um, we've really been thinking about this project since 2020, 2021, where we were invited by Toy Like Me, who are a not-for-profit organisation based in Yorkshire, and we were invited to come along and do some research with them looking at how we might use 
educational resources to foster more positive attitudes towards disability in school children, actually with the aim of looking at reductions in, in hate crime. That's actually where their funding came from with the rise in disability related hate crimes. We're trying to look at how we might target those attitudes and foster more positive attitudes in younger generations. Um, the, the study that we did then led on to what we're calling the Scottish study um, and then more recently on to a kind of co-creation of these resources. So I'm going to take you through each of these stages before finishing up by telling you about the resources themselves. So just briefly with the Yorkshire study, we, we worked with um, three different Yorkshire primary schools and 145 children and we asked them to engage with the Toy Like Me exhibition, which um, as you can see in this photo here, there's 12 images like this within the Toy Like Me exhibition and children are invited to look at these photos and engage with them using quiz and lots of discussion that goes, um, structured discussion that goes around these images, all of which represent a different disability in a prototype toy form. Um, we then asked them to write, we actually asked them to write a story about one of these characters before they'd engaged with this exhibition and then again after they'd engaged with the exhibition and we were looking at how they shifted their attitudes towards disability and those stories before and after. It's a really novel um, approach called the story completion method which um, is used to explore those um, kind of uh, implicit attitudes that, that, that people hold and it, it allows us to kind of look at those attitudes uh, in a more kind of socially constructed way and think about how they've been constructed. So it's a really useful method to use. It's also very exciting because it has, as far as we're aware, hadn't really been used on this um, scale before. And what we found were that stories written after the exhibition showed a shift in narrative. They were much less negative. There was much less a medical model discussion, more of an awareness of positive relationships and much more of a social model understanding of disability, because these are all of the components that are embedded within the exhibition and the discussion that was going along with that. We um, sort of this is just kind of take you through the method of that, which I've already kind of done. But just to show you, these are the this is what the children were given. They were given these pictures and asked to write a story very similar to Soraya's methodology, where we asked them to imagine that they were going to have a really fun day with these characters and write about an adventure that they would have with them. And um, so we got some really fantastic stories. Much of the challenge of this method is the deciphering the stories that have been written by the children and it took a whole team of us sometimes to decipher them, but we, we, we really enjoyed doing that. We also learned quite a lot from that project in terms of what we could achieve with this method and other things that we might like to do. Um, so moving from the pilot study in Yorkshire, we then moved that onto the Scottish study in 2022 and you can see some Im images here of us um, going into schools to deliver this. The real shift was that the Yorkshire study was delivered through COVID and we were not able to actually go into any of those schools. We had to send all of the information directly to um, the teachers and ask them to deliver it for us, which, which really raised with us some of the concerns that we had about not being able to really know exactly what information was being given by the teachers to the children and the way that the disabilities were being discussed. So we were kind of already aware of there being some challenges with in, in terms of the understanding of the teachers in terms of disability and the language that they might be using. So we were really thinking in terms of developing this study, how we might tackle some of those issues. We also weren't really aware of the children's understanding of disability before and after or their own um, their own experiences of disability, which is something that we realised we were going to have to include in the follow up research. So this study took place in Edinburgh and there was five schools and we talked to almost we involved almost 300 children. We also raised the age a little bit. We in the first study we were looking at children throughout the whole of the primary school. Um, but as I say, because we were asking them to write stories, we realised that actually deciphering the writing of four or five six year olds could be quite challenging and they found it quite difficult to engage with it um, a little bit without lots of support. So we moved on to ages seven to 11 for the second part of the study. So just to let you see a little bit of what actually happens once they've done the exhibition itself, um, along with the exhibition are these uh, the chatty pack, which comes with a lot of activities and discussions. So the children view all of the images, they take part in a quiz, 
But we also provide, um, we, we now provide for the teachers um, these um, d discussion points. They're talking about deafness is the one that's demonstrated here, but there are talking about um, information sheets for each of the disabilities that are represented within the images. They also are given a series of activities for their school, for their um, learners, so class challenges and get creative challenges, really getting them to think about disability in a very positive and very social way. How can we adapt the world around us to ensure that everybody is included and to really move away from that understanding of disability as being a medical issue? So there's lots of activities and lots of really positive discussion within within these resources. Um, here's some other examples of the exhibition posters that we would use. So they are, um, as I say, they're kind of prototypes, although actually when they were made, they were prototypes because there wasn't there weren't toys that represented all of these disabilities. For example, the prosthetic limb Barbie in the middle there. However, there now are on the market toys that represent these things, which we're really pleased to see. So there is there has been a lot of movement even in the time that we've been thinking about this and that we've been doing these projects. Um, again, just some little images to let you see how engaged the, the, the classes were and how, how much they enjoyed taking part in the exhibition. The good thing about this exhibition is that we can we were setting it up in all sorts of different places within the schools. We might have been in a gym hall, we might have been in a classroom, we might have been in a, in a dining hall. Um, and it's quite flexible in terms of the way that it can be used. Um, so again, we did the same methodology here where we were asking them to write as a story before and after the exhibition. But we also just wanted to ask the children outright, what is a disability? How do you understand what a disability is? Because we really wanted to see if that shifted for them. Um, and at time one, we saw a lot of discussion of not having the same ability as normal people. There was lots of discussions of normal and not normal. Um, we also saw things about being unable to do things so you can't do things, that it was sad, that people are less able. And, and we were we were surprised to see the, the, the use of the word handicap still there in children of this generation, which is a word that we thought might have um, been removed from the vernacular, but it, it, it was still present. And after they took part in the exhibition, we saw a, a shift in that and that people were talking more about being different. There were still elements of can't do things, but it was actually you, you can't necessarily do everything the same, but it's because we're different. It's not necessarily bad. And there was a move away from the sad element and the kind of negative element of it, which we also saw really clearly in the stories that the children were writing us. So here's just a couple of examples here. Um, we found that when we actually compared the mentioning of the um, disability and the stories, the disability was much more likely to be mentioned and discussed and talked about in the post exhibition stories than in the pre exhibition stories in that they were becoming more aware of it and they were they were speaking about it in a much more positive way. In this example here, we have um, this little picture of a dragon um, and the dragon is has a, a cochlear implant. Um, and the story that the child has written here is talking about, you know, finding Draggy. Draggy was missing, but they found Draggy. Then one day he falls on his ear and a day later he's at the doctor's and now he has a disability. And there's that kind of real connection, medical understanding of disability and where it comes from. In the post exhibition example here, we have Mr. Potato Head, um, who is represented as, as having a, he's using a white, um, a white cane as, somebody who is blind and he talks about Mr Potato has a disability but that doesn't mean it disables him from doing anything that we can all do well sometimes but we don't treat him differently because he is the kindest human and everybody likes him this really in incorporating that idea of acceptance of disability within their stories and we saw these are just a couple of examples but we really saw a huge shift into that that understanding and the way that they were talking about disability we also introduced in the Scottish version of the study um, more quantitative understanding, which is something we hadn't done in the pilot. So we were really interested in exactly the same sort of issues that Soraya has been discussing in terms of their intentions of their behaviour, their emotional um, understanding. And we were looking at whether or not they knew someone who was disabled. And we found that post-exhibition, they 
um, they were more likely to say that they knew someone who was disabled because they were actually, that was raising their awareness of what disability was and they were more able to identify it. And we're looking at this um, at the CATCH scores, which is an effective um, measure around, dis around disability and how that related to their behavioural CATCH scores, so their intended behaviours towards um, peers with disability. And what we found here is that post-exhibition, their um, intentions to behave more positively towards a disabled peer were um, affected by their positive feelings towards that individual. So really similar to the um, interactions that Soraya was finding as well. One of the things that we wanted to do with our resources as well is to make them as um, uh, applicable and usable within a school setting. And what we're really trying to do here is shift away from that and that tendency to only talk about disability as like a topic. So we'll talk about it this week because it's Autism Awareness Week or because it's Disability Awareness Week. And that's when we'll talk about it and then we'll forget about it. And um, so what we've done with this is mapped all of the activities and um, resources onto the Curriculum for Excellence at both first and second level. So this would be across the school just to show that actually you could be using these activities in a technology setting, in a health and wellbeing setting, in a literacy and English setting, and really thinking about how representation of disability can be embedded across the school curriculum and not only as a topic based way of thinking about it. Um, so jumping forward now to this past year and um, kind of culminating with where we are now, um, we wanted to take these resources um, as they stood, which was really just the, the, the PDF of that, um, the, the chatty pack itself, which includes all of those pictures and resources and activities, and really thinking about how we might develop those resources in order to make them as usable and inclusive and accessible as possible. Um, so what we've done with this is we, we made up some focus groups with some key stakeholders. So that includes educators, disabled adults, parents of disabled children, including observing their children at play and other stakeholders who are interested in this area and ask them to, to really candidly look at our resources for us and help us understand how we might improve them. So from those focus groups, we came up with some kind of key findings that we're trying to now incorporate and we have incorporated into the development of our resources. Um, we're really very aware that one of the biggest issues that we have here is, is the lack of, um, of literacy around disability, this kind of notion of understanding of disability and that educators really would value these kind of instructional videos, short little video clips that sit alongside the resources to really increase their confidence, help them understand the language they should be using, the way that they should be thinking about it, some suggestions of ways that they might be able to um, improve their educational settings in terms of representation. Also highlighting the that we, we, we really could be doing more to enhance the representation of more hidden disabilities in these resources. And that's something that we are still working with um, and trying to think think through. Um, but it, it's as this kind of was born out of toys, which are very kind of physical representations of disability, it's quite difficult. And we saw that from Soraya's work that Lottie have created the Hayden doll, which is designed with a, a, with a family and with an autistic child himself, who's kind of given them permission to replicate him in, in toy form. But it is quite challenging to find that in a in more general way. So that's something that we're still thinking about. Also thinking about other aspects of children's material culture, that it's not just toys that children interact with, but we really need to think about representation across the board. Um, and that actually, in some cases, the types of toys that are representative are not really the types of toys that those children are going to be playing with, but they do watch television, they do read books, they do have other images around them. And we need to think about all aspects of children's material culture when we are thinking about resources that we could be using. Um, but really, the, 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 the crux of this was that also the educator confidence in this area was really low. And we need to really think about how we might incorporate some of these resources and some of this um, understanding of um, imagined contact and representation in terms of improving um, our, our understanding of disability um, 
could be kind of fitted into educator training. So looking at it through ITE, looking at it through probation and inquiry and those sorts of different areas. So we, we really took those focus group ideas with us and really thought about what we needed to do. And I particularly, one of the things we were able to do quite quickly was to create this series of short instructional videos for practitioners to use alongside the activities. So we have done that now and they're available on our website. And um, there's five little short, when I say short, they're between five and like nine minutes. Um, where you can look at them and they give you the background, they talk about social model of understanding, they talk about language use, they talk about how you can actually change your classroom. Um, and we did that along this wonderful group of children who came in and played with all the resources for us and, and also they've been filmed using BL, BSL interpretation and closed captions to make them as accessible as we could. Um, so this is just a little screenshot of what it looks like when you go on to our um, Toybox website. We are going to be launching a new website in May and um, hopefully um, Sarah will be able to help us in, um, in, in sending out some information about that when, when the event happens. Um, but we're going to be launching a new website. But at the moment, our website is um, within the QMU website here and you can get, get it through this QR code and through this um, link. Um, when you go into the website, you'll see a tab that says educational resources. From there, you can download the PDF of the entire chatty pack, which includes all the images, all the activities, all of the mapping to the Curriculum for Excellence. And as you scroll down that page, you'll also see these five little videos that you can watch um, or that you can um, guide your students towards to watch. And these are the videos here. So you can see there's one about introducing the pack, talking about disability, thinking about disabled people and representation within the toy industry, how to do representation in your school and also taking you through step by step the resource pack and how it should be used in a classroom environment. Um, so really what I'd just like to sum up with what we why we've been doing this and what we've been doing, we really found that over the three years of doing this project now we're, we're more and more um, convinced and, and, and kind of committed to this idea that representation really and through imagined contact really does change children's attitudes towards disability and moves them in a much more positive way. Um, we, we've developed these resources to try and really maximise the accessibility and reach of the resources and we will continue to build on this foundation. We're actually currently also building a micro credential to improve educator literacy around disability, which we'll be launching again in September, which is a little short course, um, a little short six week online course that, that um, we'll be welcoming practitioners onto to, to again just build on this work again. Um, but I think really the crux of it is that disability representation is really simple. It actually can be done without huge amounts of resources, but with just a little bit of thought and attention and really maybe just shifting some of our own understanding about disability and how we should be approaching it. Um, and it, it can really help move towards better inclusion within our schools and the knock on effect on wider society. And, and I think through imagination and play, which is so important to our children's development, that's it's a really key way that we can kind of tap into tap into that. Um, OK, so uh, that's a long time for you all to listen to us talking. Um, but we have another little Jamboard discussion here about how you might implement these resources into ITE. Or indeed, if you already are doing something along these lines within ITE, we would really like to hear from you. I can safely say that um, ITE students at QMU will be getting, are getting this um, in spades. And so it would just be really, it'd be really helpful to hear if anybody would like to tap in to, sorry, would like to join in that discussion. Um, I'm just going to pull up the second. Um, exam uh, board. I'll just move this on. OK, so if anyone has anything they'd like to add to this, um, please feel free. How might you implement these resources into ITE? Um, yeah, and I think at this point we'll, we'll also hand the floor over to Donna um, and say um, 
if there are any other questions while you're doing that that you spring to mind, then this is the point to open that discussion. Yeah. 